Connors T, how are ye? My name is Sarika. I'm the co-founder of Candela Tales and I'm sitting here in the office on my own because we're in lockdown. And because we're in lockdown, myself and Aaron are not able to physically be in the same space. So we are going to be putting out podcasts, hopefully once a week for the next little while. And rather than doing our usual post show chat, we are going to live stream the post show chat. And if you want to catch that, that's going to be on our Instagram channel this Saturday, the 4th of April, uh, probably at one o'clock. But double check our social media for that. And that means you'll be able to ask any questions you have about this story and you'll be able to talk to us as well. And uh, I hope some of you join us. But until then, just settle in and enjoy the story. The Pursuit of Dermot and Gronia, Part 1 Gronia was the daughter of the High King of all Ireland, Cormac MacArt. And Cormac MacArt was known as the greatest king that Ireland had ever had. This was a man who codified the Brehan laws, the legal code that was passed down for generations on this island. A legal system without prisons or police. And he was a wonderful father, and he was a wonderful man, but he had a recurring conflict with another great man in Ireland at that time. And that man was Fionn McCool, the leader of the Fionn. Sometimes Cormac McGart and Fionn McCool got along and everything was fine. At other times, there would be tension between the two, perhaps inevitably for two such powerful people sharing a small island at the time. But Gronia was her own person. She had no part in their rivalries. She had no part in their feud. She was the king's daughter. She was beautiful as she grew up. But she was also intelligent as wise as her father. If not, she thought, maybe even a little more wise than he. And one day, when Gronia was still quite a young girl, she was watching a game of hurling, and she saw a boy on the hurling field with curling dark hair and red cheeks and his hair was grown down long over his forehead and he caught the ball in this graceful movement caught it and turned and threw it and hit it all in one motion and he scored a goal and everyone was looking at where the ball went to but Gronia was looking at the hurler so she saw the wind blow his hair back from his face. And in that moment, she felt something she had never felt before. And she decided that she was in love with the boy from the hurling field. Time went on and Gronia grew up. More and more beautiful more and more elegant, more and more well-educated. She could stand with any speaker in the world. And as the daughter of the High King of Ireland, she met kings and sons of kings from all over the world. But there began to be a bit of a reputation that grew up around Gronia, the daughter of Cormac McGart because no matter who asked her father 
for her hand in marriage, he would turn them down, regardless of their status. And so time went on, and Gronia did not marry. Now, what nobody else knew was that it wasn't Cormac McGart who was turning down Gronia's suitors. He wanted her to get married. He brought their suit to her, and he sometimes argued for some of these men because he thought that it was high time that his daughter settled down, frankly. But there was a secret part of Gronia that was waiting. She was waiting for her true love. In every story she'd ever heard, the king's daughter finds her true love. And in that small, secret part of her heart, she knew that her true love was that boy from the hurling field so long ago. But of course, as she got older, and as more and more eligible suitors came forward, and as more and more of them were rejected, and she let her father take the blame, she began to doubt herself. She began to think, really, she was a little too old for this childish fantasy. Maybe she ought to make a sensible match, settle down with somebody appropriate, and leave aside this daydream about the boy on the herding field. And so, she put aside her daydreams, and she resolved that the next man who asked for her hand, if she could find nothing objectionable in him, she would accept the proposal. Now it was around this time that Fionn McCool of the Fianna, well his son Oshin noticed that he was getting up earlier and earlier in the mornings, outside his home on the hill of Allen, and he was walking out alone. And one morning Oshin came to him and asked him what was wrong with him, if he was all right. Now Fionn's wife had died a year before and Fionn confided in his son that he just didn't sleep well without a wife. He was waking up because he was alone. And when Oshin heard that he said, but surely any woman in Ireland would marry you. Whether she was married or not, any woman in Ireland would marry you. You're Fionn McCool. All you have to do is ask. And so Fionn said, I suppose, might be time to marry again. And Oshin's cousin was there and he said, you know who you should marry is Gronia, the daughter of the High King, because she's pretty impressive, as I hear. And so he and Oshin went to Cormac McGart to ask for Gronia's hand in marriage. See, because of the bad blood between them, Fionn didn't want to ask the king directly because it'd be awkward then if Cormac told him no, but he figured if he sent his son Oshin instead as a proxy, Cormac would be able to refuse Oshin without giving too much offence. He was aware of the reputation around Gronia, that Cormac didn't want to let her go to anyone. Now when Oshin and his cousin arrived at Tara, the High King Cormac McGard said, look, your father and I have a bit of a history and I want you to understand perfect I'm not the one who's turning all of these people away I'm putting the choice to my daughter I've done it every single time and I'm going to do it again you can come with me now you'll hear her answer from her own lips I'm not the unreasonable one here so the three men went to Gronia and asked her if she would marry Fionn Maku, the captain of the Fian. And Gronia, having come to her resolution, turned to her father and said, Well, if you have no objections to him as a son-in-law, I have no objections to him as a husband. And with that, and much to Cormac McGart's surprise and secret delight, arrangements were made. Gronia and Fionn McCool 
were to be married. So arrangements were made and a wedding feast was held at Tara. And Gronia stayed back because Gronia, among other things, knew the power of a good entrance. So she waited as the feasting hall filled up with guests. Many she knew, but then the members of the Fianna came in, these men and women who lived off the land, these warriors and protectors of Ireland. And as she looked at them in their strange, wild way, she suddenly started to feel a little apprehensive. So she asked her servant to name the members of the Fianna as they came and sat down at the table. She pointed out, there was the thin, grey man, Quilta Macronan. There was Oshin, son of Fionn McCool. There was Oscar, son of Oshin. And there was Fionn McCool himself, sitting down next to her father, clasping his shoulder in friendship. And when Gronia saw Fionn McCool, she said, hang on, that's Fionn McCool. <sighs> He's... Maybe I should have known that this was going to be the case, but he's so old. It seems so strange now that I'm looking at him that he didn't ask for my hand in marriage for his son. Even his grandson is closer in age to me than this man is. And then she saw, sitting on the other side, of Fionn McCool, a man who threw back his head and laughed, and his teeth were like pearls, his cheeks were ruddy red, and his hair was dark and curling and he wore it down over his forehead. And she gripped the arm of her servant and she said, who is that? And her serving maid said, well, that's Dermot Dodivna, the greatest lover of women that has ever been known in the world. He has a Balshirka love spot on his forehead, and anyone who sees it falls hopelessly in love with him. But of course, Gronia cared nothing for the love spot. She wanted to know his name for the first time in many years she was looking at him the boy from the herding field then Gronia gave a cup to her serving maid and she asked her to give it to Fionn McCool and tell him it was from her and ask him to drink and pass it on to his men but not to the captains of the Fionn not to Oshin or Dermid or MacLuga, or Quilcha MacRonan. And then, when they'd all drunk, to give the cup to her father and her brother and ask them to pass it on to all of their men. And her serving maid did this. And Gronia watched as one by one the men and women in the feasting hall drank deeply from her cup and put their heads down on the table and fell asleep. And eventually, when they were all sound asleep, Gronia threw back the curtain she'd been standing behind and she swept into the room, all arrayed in her wedding finery. And the men who were still awake looked at her, appreciative. And then Gronia went up to Oshin, the son of Fionn McCool, and she said, You know, Oshin, it seems to me a strange thing that Fionn McCool would ask for my hand when you and I are closer in age. Would you run away with me? And Oshin was shocked and a little perturbed and he said, well, no. 
Don't say that in front of Fionn McCool, because if you said that in front of him, he'd want nothing to do with you. And I will not run away with you, because you're engaged to my father. And then Gronia went to Dermot Odivna. She asked him the same question. And Dermot, too, refused. And then Gronia said, well, I put a gesh on you. You must run away with me. And if you do not, ruin and disaster will descend on you. The pains of a woman in childbirth and the face of a drowned man. Dermot said to Gronia, I will not run away with you unless you come to me neither naked nor clothed, neither on foot nor on horseback, neither inside nor outdoors. And Gronia got a gleam in her eye that he didn't much like, but she left and gave him a moment to catch his breath and to think. And he turned to the other men of the Fianna, those that were still awake, and he asked Oshin what should he do. And Oshin said, any man who breaks a gesh is doomed. You have to go with her. And so agreed all of the Fianna. And Quilton MacRonan added that although he had been happily married for many years, he was a little bit gutted that Gronia hadn't fallen in love with him. And so with their advice, Dermid, prepared to run away with Gronia, gathered his weapon and got himself ready, still hoping that she might fail his test. But before he had much chance to nurse that hope, the door opened and there was Gronia. She'd taken off her fine wedding dress and now was not naked but not clothed either, wrapped up only in a blanket. And she was not on foot, nor on horseback. She sat astride a billy goat. And she was not indoors, nor outside, where she stood exactly at the threshold. And somehow, although she had been dressed in the finest of finery the last time he saw her, Somehow, wrapped in a blanket and sitting on a goat, she was even more beautiful than she had been before. And so Dermot gathered his belonging and fled with Bronya. They had not gotten far down the road when her feet began to hurt, she being the High King's daughter and not much used to running. Dermot said, look, we can go back. Nobody's had time to miss you. You can pretend that you went for a nap in your chambers and nobody will be any the wiser. But Gronia said, no, that was not what she wanted to do. What she wanted was for Dermot to go back to the stables, get two horses in a chariot and bring them back for her and take her away in the style to which she was accustomed as the daughter of the High King. Dermot said no, and Gronia said, well, I put a gash on you. And so Dermot had to say, all right. And back he went to get the horses and the chariot. They rode the chariot as far as the Shannon, at the ford of Othluan, and there they dismounted. Dermot left one horse on one bank and the other on the other bank, and they walked a full mile in the river's current before leaving it just to fool the trackers of the Fianna and when they got onto dry land and hid in the woods Dermot said he was pretty sure that nobody in Ireland could find them now and then they heard a voice that said and how are things Dermot and Dermot looked around to see his foster father Angus Og. Angus Ogue doted on Dermid. Some say that he had given Dermid the love spot on his forehead. Being a god of love, 
and loving to see people in love. And Angus was quite delighted with this turn of events, thought it was all very romantic and exciting, running away with an unsuitable woman, being pursued by a jealous husband, or fiancé in this case. He thoroughly approved, and he promised to help them in any way that he could. The first help that he gave them was in the form of advice. He told Dermid and Gronya that they must keep moving to keep ahead of the Fianna, and that they must never eat their food in the same place as they cooked it, and they must never go to bed in the same place as they ate, and they must never get up in the morning from the place where they lay down the night before. And this last bit was a little confusing for Dermid, but Gronia made it clear to him. She said, we're going to have to get up in the middle of the night and move. Dermid said, yeah, that sounds about right. Fionn McCool is going to be furious. And so on they went. And Fionn McCool was indeed furious set off in hot pursuit of them and when the trail was lost to the Shannon he was more furious still he was relentless and he was not going to let Dermot get away with this insult however the other members of the Fianna were a good deal more reluctant they loved Dermot as their brother they didn't want to pursue him and hunt him and after all Gronia had put a gash on him there wasn't much the poor fellow could do at every place that Dermot and Gronia stopped and cooked, but did not eat, the trackers of the Fianna began to find something. A little piece of meat or fish, a tiny piece of flesh, was always left out, uncooked, beside the fire. And when Fionn McCool saw it, he seemed to get, if anything, even angrier. O'Sheen explained to the others what it was. A message from Dermot that he had not touched Gronia. They were not lovers. Perhaps a message of regret, of reconciliation or hope of reconciliation. But the fury of Fionn McCool was not abated by these signs and tokens. After a time, Dermot determined that he would face Fionn McCool would look him in the eye would see with his own eyes if there was any hope of reconciliation and so that day when they stopped to cook they stayed where they were and ate where they cooked although Gronia grew nervous tried to persuade Dermot to leave but he said no and after they'd eaten they lay down to sleep and Gronia again tried to persuade him to leave and again he said, no, no. I want to see Fionn McCool. I want to look in his eye. And as the sky darkened to night, a great brindled hound came in and laid her head on Dermot's chest and looked up at him, big sorrowful eyes. And Dermot scratched her behind the ears and said, Go on now, Bran. We'll be all right. The other members of the Fianna had sent Fionn's own hound, Bran, ahead to warn Dermot that they were coming. And in the morning, they heard the sound of the army surrounding their little house. Gronia by this time was terrified, and Angus Og appeared. He offered to spare them both away, but Dermot said, No, I am staying. Let you take Gronia on ahead and I'll catch up. But I need to face Fionn McCool. And so Angus Og took Gronia, brought her away, and Dermot went to the first door and opened it. And there he saw Ushin. And Ushin said, Dermot, quick, come out this way. I'll let you through. You can escape. But he would not. He went on to the next door and the next. And at every one of those doors, he found an ally and a friend. 
willing to let him leave. But at the seventh door, he met the red, rage-filled eye of Fionn McCool. And Fionn McCool did not even speak to Dermot. He let out something between a roar and a scream and charged at him. And when Dermot saw the hatred in the eyes of Fionn McCool, the man he loved like a father, the man he'd followed into every danger, he knew there was nothing to talk about. And so he took out his spear and he used it to vault over Fionn McCool's head. He slipped away and joined Gronya and Angus Oak. And they ran on. They made their beds in hedges. They made their beds in caves, along cliffs, up trees, in every place that they could find a place to rest. And Dermid would make it as comfortable as possible. But for a long time, he would not touch Gronia. Until one day, they were crossing a river, one of many they crossed. And Gronia had her skirts bundled up around her, hiked up high to keep them from getting wet in the water. And a little splash of water landed high up on her leg. She called Dermot's attention to it. She said, Dermot O'Divna, you are accounted a brave man. Why then is there more courage in this drop of water? This one, right here, see it? Why is there more courage in this drop of water than there is in you? And hearing that, and seeing that, the last of Dermid's self-control was lost. And from that night on, he left no tokens to Fionn Rakul, no signs to say that he and Gronia were still separate. Because from that day on, they ran together. Okay, that was the first half of the pursuit of Dermot and Gronia. Join us on Saturday the 4th of April on Instagram Live to have a post-show chat about it. This podcast was produced and edited by Oshin Ryan, story by Surika and Aaron Hegarty, and obviously the voice on this podcast is me, Surika Hegarty. If you'd like to support us, you can go to patreon.com forward slash candlelit tales and you can find more of our stuff on our new YouTube channel and details of everything we do on our website. Currently, there aren't any upcoming performances, but you can still check out our website. And Aaron's not here to do his little yo sound at the end, so see you Saturday, I guess. You?